lifting and moving. Chapter six. All right, hold on. All right, the focus of this chapter is more specific to work workforce safety and wellness, and it's gonna be entirely on proper lifting techniques and how to move patients without causing harm to you, your crew members, bystanders, or family members. Introduction. In this course, in the course of a call, AEMTs move patients several times. It's a big part of the job. Likely involve the use of a stretcher, bot board, or other device that you think might be appropriate to move the patient. To move patients without injury, you need to lift lift and carry the patient properly and safely. When lifting and carrying, you must know where providers should be positioned, how to give and receive lifting commands, how to prepare patient moving devices, when and how to use patient moving devices. So it needs to be a coordinated effort. You need to know the strengths and weaknesses of your crew members. The strongest need to have control of the upper body. Weakest would have control of the lower body. Um, choose the most appropriate technique and equipment to move the patient that will put the least amount of strain or stress on you and your crew members. Training and practice are required to use equipment. So any equipment that you're going to use to move the patient, you need to be very familiar with the equipment. An anatomy review. Weight of anything being lifted and carried is reflected onto the shoulder girdle, the rib cage, spinal column, pelvis, and legs. And from your EMT training, you would have learned that when we're lifting, we do not use our, our back to lift. We, we execute lifting by keeping the back straight and using the, the legs to bear weight because the, the back or the spinal column wasn't designed to bear weight. In lifting, the shoulder girdle is aligned over the pelvis, hands are held close to the body. Force exerted against the spine occurs in an essentially straight line down the vertebrae. Keep the back in a straight upright vertical position. And even with this picture that is being depicted, the back should be straighter than that, right? So, Back needs to be straight. The weight need to be a beard by the legs. Avoid twisting and bending. You may injure your back if you lift with your back. So this picture is a no-no. That don't attempt to lift anybody like that. So we don't want any curve in the back. It should be straight. Legs should be spread about 15 inches apart or um, shoulder length equal distance. With your back held upright, bring your upper body down by bending the legs. So the back remains straight and we squat down and we keep the weight close to the body. So usually you want your, your arms in a flex position you don't want the arms to be too extended. The more extended the arms are, the weaker they become. Properly grasp the patient or a stretcher. Use your power grips. Lift the patient by straightening your legs. Do not lift a patient or a heavy object with your arms outstretched. I already explained that. Once the arms start to get to extend, 
they become weaker. So when it's flexed, you have more control and that strength can be maintained much longer. Avoid placing lateral force across the spine and sideways and sideways leverage against the lower back. Always avoid bending at the waist. Proper hold. To, you know your power grip. To perform your power grip, face your palms up. Keep your hands at least 10 inches apart. Insert each hand under the handle with the palm facing up and the thumb extended upward. Curl your fingers and thumb tightly over the top of the handle. And that is what it looks like. And make sure you're in proper position before any lifting starts and make sure that your crew members are in properly proper position. So if before the lift, observe what's happening. If any adjustments are needed, make adjustments for yourself and your crew member. Never grasp a stretcher or backboard with the hand placed palm down over the handle. Directions and commands. Team actions must be coordinated. Orders that will initiate lifting or moving or any significant changes in movement should be given in two parts. Preparatory command, command of execution. So preparation, get ready, get, get your hands in position. Everybody get your hands in position. All right, good. Gonna lift on three. So prepare, execute. Example, team leader says, all ready to stop. Then the team leader says, stop. We're going to lift on three, one, two, three. I'm going to count to three, and then we're going to lift, one, two, three, lift. Principles of safe reaching and pulling. Body drag. Uses the same principles as lifting and carrying. Keep the back locked and straight. Avoid hyperextending your back. Keep your reach within the recommended distance. During pulling, extend your arms no more than about 15 to 20 inches in front of your torso. <clears throat> Pull the patient by slowly flexing your arms. Avoid situations that involve strenuous effort lasting more than a minute. Moving a patient across a bed. Kneel on the bed to avoid reaching beyond the recommended distance. Follow steps for a body drag until the patient is within 15 to 20 inches of the bed edge. And you can use the sheet or blanket to get them to the, the edge of the bed. Um, unless a backboard transfer the patient you, sorry, unless on a backboard transfer the patient from the stretcher to a bed in the ED or the patient's hospital room with a body track. I am a big advocate of the, the sheet or blanket method for moving a patient. So if it's not a rush, that's a method I use. Um, but the body drag can work or but just make sure that um, the upper middle and lower portion of the patient is under control and moves as a unit two person body drag you and another provider may have to pull the patient with one of you on each side of the patient alter the usual pulling technique to prevent pulling sideways Log roll in a patient. Things that we are very familiar with, right? In order to effectively perform a log roll, you need at least four persons. One person to control the head and give commands. One person to control the upper body. One person to control the, the lower body and the spine board. And you're good to go. Can be done with less, but ideally, four persons. 
So log roll in a patient. Kneel as close to the patient as possible. I'm, I'm a big advocate of putting the arm across the chest or up to where the head is. I don't like to roll people on their limbs. Roll the patient without stopping until the patient is resting on his or her side. Ensure that when you're kneeling to roll the patient, your knees are not in the position where the patient is going to turn. So sometimes your, your knees can be too close and when the patient turns, they are not completely on their side. Avoid doing that. And that's one of the reasons why I move the, the hand from the side and put it across the chest or uh, above the, the head. So once I move the hand from that space, I don't allow my knees to get into that space because that's where the patient is going to roll. Rolling a wheeled ambulance stretcher. <clears throat> While you're walking, and pulling the stretcher, bend slightly forward at the hips. Um, second AEMT should guide the head. So one person push while the other pull. Person at the head would be pushing, person at the lower extremity would be pulling. And we travel foot first with the stretcher. When we're going to load it <clears throat> in the back of the unit, it is head first. Lifting and carrying a patient on a backboard or stretcher, use a device that can be rolled to move a patient. Use four providers to carry a stretcher, one AEMT at each corner. You might not have so many AEMTs, it might be EMTs that you have to assist you. Having that many AEMTs is a luxury. Weight and distribution. Estimate the patient's weight before attempting to lift him or her. Um, I'm not a good, uh, I'm not good at estimating a patient weight. What I do is if I can kneel and reach over and touch the opposite side of the patient. So if I can kneel beside a patient and reach over without any strain on my back and touch the opposite side of the patient, then it means that me and my partner can lift or move that patient. That's what I use to determine if I can move a patient. If I kneel and I can't reach over the opposite side without um, putting any strain or just definitely can't reach, then I know that I need additional help to move that patient. Know how much you can comfortably and safely lift. So you need to know what you can manage. You should be able to manage your body weight. Um, at, in some, some um, courses, it is, there's a physical fitness test required. I believe they have to be able to lift 220 or 225 or 250 pounds between you and your partner. But um, just know what you can manage, but you should be able to manage your body weight. Know the weight limitations of the equipment you are using. Place the strongest AEMT at the patient's head. I would say place the strongest AEMT at the upper body because it's not just the head you want to control. You want to control the, the head and upper body, right? Carrying a patient up and down stairs. Ensure two strongest AEMTs are positioned at the head, end, and foot end. Do not attempt to lift or carry the patient a significant distance if you believe you are approaching maximum capacity. If you feel like it, you may have to um, take a break. Planning the move. Move the patient in an orderly, planned, directed, unhurried manner. We don't need to rush. Plan ahead. Select methods that involve the least lifting and carrying. Share any issue that may result in injury 
to anyone involved in the move. Diamond carry. Used to lift and carry a patient on a backboard or stretcher. Four rescuers, one at the head end of the device, one at the foot end of the device, one on each side of the patient's torso. Now, um, I, I am not a, I'm, this is not a technique that I use a lot. I prefer to have um, two, two rescuers at the head, two rescuers at the lower extremity on opposite side. So two on this side, two on the other side. And I, I, I'm not a fan of the, the diamond carry. It can be used though. I just prefer two on one side, two on the other. <clears throat> to carry a patient through a narrow doorway or hallway, modify your positions. So they're showing the modification here. One-handed carrying technique. Four or more AEMTs each use one hand to support the backboard. Pick up and carry the backboard with your back in the locked-in position. To compensate for weight imbalance, you may need additional assistance or reevaluate the carry. More persons you have to assist, the better. Emergency moves. Emergency moves are used before you make um, contact with a patient and assess the ABCs. So this is a technique that is going to be executed before any type of assessment of the patient is done. If you have recognized that there is danger to the, the, the patient and yourself and crew members, I need to move that patient as quickly as possible. All drugs are emergency moves. So all drugs are considered emergency moves. If alone, use a drug to pull the patient along the long axis of the body. Certain guidelines during the move will help avoid further injury to the patient. To move a patient on his or her back, pull on the patient's clothing in the neck and shoulder area. So you can use a, a clothes drag. You can use a blanket or coat drag. I prefer blanket. Might not be applicable in all situation. I also prefer the underarm drag. So use what you're comfortable with and make sure you can manage the weight of the patient before you attempt the technique. Hold on. To move a patient on his or her back, continue to grasp the wrist and with the arms elevated above the ground, drag the patient, that's a arm drag. Place your arms under the patient's shoulders and through the armpits and drag the patient backward. That's the underarm drag, which I like that one because it gives me more control over the patient's upper body. And that's always my goal for myself and my team when moving a patient. We need to make sure that we have good control of the patient's upper body because that's where the head, neck, and the, the spine is located. So we want proper control of that side. One person drags, carries, and lifts. So you have your front cradle. This is for a patient that's light. Firefighters drag. One person walking assists. The firefighters carry and pack strap carry. These are techniques that you are all familiar with. Now, an urgent move, the difference between the emergency move and the urgent move is an urgent move is required when you have done an assessment. So an assessment of the patient has taken place 
and you recognize that the patient is unstable or there is a patient that is unstable that you need to get to and a patient that is stable is in front of that patient. So you go on a motor vehicle accident, two persons in the car, the ones that, that is closest to you is fine, but the one over the other side is not. You can use an urgent move to move the stable patient to get to the unstable one. <clears throat> now, necessary when a patient requires immediate life-saving care in an unsafe environment. In other words, they are unstable. Use rapid extrication technique when a patient is sitting in a vehicle and must be urgently moved. So an example of an urgent move is rapid extrication. It, it, there is greater risk for spine movement. It requires team, a team of three rescuers who, are, who have practiced the procedure. So they need to be very comfortable with the procedure. And rapid extrication is basically extrication with the C collar and the spine board, that's it. So you're not using a kid to, to secure the head and lower spine, the head and spinal column, sorry, before turning the patient to get them on the spine board. Now, non-urgent moves are for stable patients. Use when the scene and the patient are stable. Carefully plan how to move the patient. Share any issues that you notice. Adapt procedures to meet your needs on a case-by-case -case basis. So use the technique that is most appropriate based on the situation, based on your patient type, based on your patient body weight, all of that. You have the direct ground lift used for patients with no suspected spinal injury found lying supine on the ground, used when patients will need to be carried a distance to the stretcher. Extremity lift used for patients with no suspected extremity or spinal injury who are supine or in a sitting position. Transfer moves. You have direct carry method, draw sheet method, which is my favorite. Other carries using a backboard, scoop stretcher. I am a big advocate for the scoop stretcher, um, scoop backboard. That's what is used more commonly now than the spine board. So matter of fact, we don't we have we have the spine board on the unit, but the scoop board is the is the way forward our scoop stretcher based on the new spinal motion restriction guidelines. Um, assisting an able patient, you can just assist them because they can move on their own. Geriatric patients may have skeletal changes. So they may have brittle bones, they may have rigidity, they may have spinal curvature. And based on the type of curvature they have and the space between the device, you may have to put some padding. So anywhere there is space between the patient, body and the device, you may have to put padding. Um, they have vacuums, um, ma mattress devices that can conform to the shape of the body. That might be an option. Now, skin changes. Geriatrics have delicate skin. So the, their skin will tear easily, they bruise easily. Um, and this can occur with simple moves. Um, there's a sense of fear in these patients. So be gentle, be compassionate, allay the patient's fear, fears with a sympathetic and compassionate approach. Slow down, explain, and anticipate. Bariatrics now. The bariatrics, branch of medicine concerned with management of obesity and allied disease. Direct correlation between degree of obesity and frequency and severity of health problems. Back injuries take a toll on healthcare workers, and these can be career-ending injuries. Equipment 
equipment are being produced with ever high capacity. So they are actually making devices to assist in moving these patients. You have bariatric units, you have bariatric stretchers, you have mini cranes, as I call them. I don't remember the, the actual name. Um, the wheel ambulance stretcher can be rolled along the ground and weighs between 40 to 145 pounds. Stretchers have a specific head end and foot end. Strong horizontal re rectangular tubular metal frame, which is with um, retractable guard rail or rails. On the side of the main frame of the stretcher is uh, supported on a folding on the carriage. So we, you can alter the, the shape of the stretcher. Use proper lifting mechanics to lift the wheel ambulance stretcher. And I mean, in first world system, most of the stretchers now you just press a button and it moves. You don't necessarily have to do a lot of lifting with it. You can press a button and it adjusts to the, the, the lowering level that you want it, but you have to press it when you want it to stop. <clears throat> And you have some stretchers now that will load themselves. All you have to really do is just push it in. So the technology is advancing so that there's not a lot of um, stress or strain on our bodies as responders when lifting or manipulating the, the stretcher. Some patients, of course, will be will need to be secured on a backboard depending on the, the nature of the emergency. Bariatric stretchers, specialized wheel stretcher for overweight or obese patients, has a wider patient surface area, wider wheel base, increased weight lifting capacity. And usually we have to request this unit. So it's a bariatric unit and a, a team will come with that unit to assist. Pneumatic and electronic powered wheel stretchers, that's the way forward, developed to decrease the potential for back injuries to EMS providers. It's battery operated with electronic controls. Love this stretcher. Added controls and equipment increase weight of stretcher. So this is a stretcher, the stretcher I was using um, in the service in Texas. Love this stretcher. Loading the wheel stretcher into an ambulance, one AEMT must hold the main frame to ensure it will not roll. Retract the undercarriage. If you are going down steps, clamp, clamps hold the stretcher in place until they are released at the hospital. Stretcher is designed to be rolled on regular flat surface. Some stretchers include intravenous IV pole, that's standard, carry to whole electro, and some stretchers have an area on it that you can put your cardiac monitor or AED and an area for the, the um, small oxygen cylinder and some of extra wheels below the head end. Portable folding stretchers, so or a field stretcher. Stretcher with rectangular tubular metal frame with rigid fabric stretch across it. Some models have two wheels used in areas that are difficult to, to reach. Weight much, weigh much less than wheel stretchers. You'll see this a lot in the JDF out here. So this stretcher is used a lot in the JDF. Um, some private services in Jamaica have them. They use them at um, standby for football matches or sport events. Flexible stretcher can be rolled up so the stretcher becomes a small tubular package. Stretchers conform around 
a patient's sides and do not extend beyond them. Most uncomfortable stretcher, but provides excellent support and immobilization. So it's a good stretcher to keep the, the spine from shifting. Backboards. Backboards used to carry immobilized patients with suspected spinal injury and backboards are being phased out. Most protocols are going towards the scoop device. Right? That is what is preferred now. Commonly used for patients who are found lying down, most are made of plastic. Short backboards or half backboards are used to immobilize the head, torso, neck of a seated patient. Um, the kid, again, most protocols are kind of moving away from the use of the Kendrick extrication device because it's delaying the extrication. So it's really um, self-extrication or rapid extrication that is being done now. But the KED can be used to stabilize the pelvis and it can be used to stabilize a femur fracture. Vacuum mattress, very good stretcher or device for geriatric patients, fits snugly to the curvature and contours of the body, provides a high degree of immobilization and comfort, reduces the risk of hyperthermia, cannot be used on patients weighing 350 pounds or more. Basket stretcher, this is a very nice one as well. Um, it is used in uneven terrain and remote locations. Can be used along with spine board. Design allows water to drain through the stretcher. So this was another device that I, we, I was familiar with in, when I was working with the company in Texas. I didn't use it though. It's the, the firefighters that came they, there was a patient that we had to respond to that fell off a cliff and fell on some rock, about 15 feet. And they we requested a rescue team and they brought this stretcher. This was a stretcher that they used to bring him up. When he came up, we took over. <clears throat> Made of plastic with aluminum frame or full steel frame connected by woven wire mesh. Very uncomfortable for patient unless padded. Not all basket stretchers are rated appropriate for each specialized rescue. Scoop stretcher, love, lovely stretcher. Well, not this type, but the scoop is the, the way forward. I prefer the scoop backboard or the I prefer the yellow um, scoop, the plastic frame one. That's more comfortable for the patient. Designed to be split into two or four pieces. <clears throat> pieces are fitted around the patient. Both sides of the patient must be accessible to use a scoop stretcher. You cannot slip a scoop stretcher under the long axis of the patient's body. Steer chair, very useful device. It's an adjunct for moving a conscious patient up or down stairs. Most models have rubber wheels in the back with casters in front. Ensure the wheel ambulance stretcher is at the proper height. Moving a patient on stairs, on stairs with a backboard. Do not use a stair chair if a patient is unresponsive. Secure the patient onto a backboard. Ensure the strongest provider is positioned at the head end of the patient. Place both the backboard and the patient on the stretcher, then secure both to the stretcher with additional straps. And if you're going to be moving a, a patient downstairs on a backboard, 
the patient need to be fully secured on the backboard. There should be no shifting of the patient. There, you have to pad all the spaces on the backboard. It's gonna make your, your job easy or easier. Neonatal isolates used to safely transport a neonatal patient from one hospital to another, keep, keeps neonatal patient warm with moistened air in a clean environment, protects from noise, drafts, infection, and excess handling, often used by advanced pediatric personnel. Decontamination. Decontaminate equipment after each use to prevent the spread of diseases. Know and follow your local standard operating procedures for disinfecting equipment. Follow your guidelines. Patient positioning. Patient with a potential spinal injury should be fully immobilized. Patient with no suspected injury who reports chest pain or respiratory distress should be placed in the position of comfort. So if it's chest pain or respiratory issues, position of comfort or the position that is best for the patient. Patients in shock should be packaged and placed in the supine position. Patients in the third trimester of pregnancy should be positioned on their left side because we don't want to compromise the venous return. So if you put them flat, the venous return can be compromised and that can drop the blood pressure very low. That can be detrimental for the patient. Place an unresponsive patient with no suspected spinal injury, hip or pelvic injury in the recovery position if they have adequate chest rise. Transport a patient who is nauseated or vomiting in a position of comfort, but manage and maintain a patent airway. Maintain the dignity of obese patients. Medical restraints. Um, not commonly used, but it may be required based on the nature of the call. There are exceptions. First, evaluate the patient for correctable causes of combativeness. So if the patient is be behaving combative, is it because of a medical condition? And if it is because of a medical condition, is there a treatment that you can provide that can reverse this issue? Follow local protocols, obtain medical control authorization if necessary. Restraint requires a minimum of five personnel. More than five might be needed, but it shouldn't be less than five. Um, the limbs need to be controlled and the upper body needs to be controlled. And when controlling the limbs of a patient that is combative, you need joint control. So you have to control the elbow and wrist joint. You have to lock that joint into a position of extension. Once a patient is able to bend the elbow or wrist, they're going to pull, right? They're going to be able to pull you back and forward. So you need to have control of a, the joint. And to get control of a person's joint, you have to keep that joint in the extended position. So if you lock it in the extended position, it's very difficult for the person to bend because the joint is weak, right? <clears throat> and that is general there is exception. So there are persons who are extremely strong, right? There are persons who have unusual core strength and they are very strong based on their background, whether it was sports or weightlifting or whatever, but they are very strong and it can be difficult even 
when you have control of the joint in a lock position to keep them from moving around. But make sure you don't take up what you can't manage, right? Um, know the limitations of yourself and your crew members. Don't do anything that is going to put yourself or your crew members at risk for any long-term injuries. Patient must be in the supine position when preparing to secure him or her on the stretcher. So never restrain a patient face down or in the prone position um, that can result in respiratory complication and that can become a legal issue. Personal consideration. Questions before moving a patient, right? So one, Am I physically strong enough to lift or move this patient? I tell you, I work it out. You probably have a different way. Um, as I said earlier, if I can remain at that, this side, if I think I can stay at the patient's side and reach over and touch them without any strain, then I think I can manage. Is there adequate room to get the proper stance to lift the patient? That's very important. So make sure you have the space and room to maneuver to get your body in the proper position. Do I need additional personnel for lifting assistance? Gauge the, the strength and weight of this patient. An injured rescue cannot help anyone, right? So don't do anything that is going to cause injury to yourself. And that brings us to the end of this chapter.